Good evening, and welcome back to Booked for the Night. Tonight we're reading chapters 18 through 21 of the story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting. Enjoy. The 18th chapter, Smells. Your uncle must now be found, said the doctor. That is the next thing, now that we know he wasn't thrown into the sea. Then Dab Dab came up to him again and whispered, Ask the eagles to look for the man. No living creature can see better than an eagle. When they are miles high in the air, they can count the ants crawling on the ground. Ask the eagles. So the doctor sent one of the swallows off to get some eagles. And in about an hour, the little bird came back with six different kinds of eagles. A black eagle, a bald eagle, a fish eagle, a golden eagle, an eagle vulture, and a white-tailed sea eagle. Twice as high as the boy they were, each one of them, and they stood on the rail of the ship like round-shouldered soldiers, all in a row, stern and still and stiff, while their great gleaming black eyes shot darting glances here and there and everywhere. Gub-Gub was scared of them and got behind a barrel. He said he felt as though those terrible eyes were looking right inside him to see what he had stolen for lunch. And the doctor said to the eagles, A man has been lost, a fisherman with red hair and an anchor marked on his arm. Would you be so kind as to see if you can find him for us? This boy is the man's nephew. Eagles do not talk very much, and all they answered in their husky voices was, You may be sure that we will do our best for John Doolittle. Then they flew off, and Gub-Gub came out from behind his barrel to see them go. Up and up and up they went, higher and higher and higher still. Then, when the doctor could only just see them, they parted company and started going off in all different ways, north, east, south, and west, looking like tiny grains of black sand creeping across the wide blue sky. My gracious, said Gub-Gub in a hushed voice. What a height! I wonder they don't scorch their feathers so near the sun. They were gone a long time, and when they came back, it was almost night. And the eagles said to the doctor, We have searched all the seas and all the countries and all the islands and all the cities and all the villages in this half of the world, but we have failed. In the main street of Gibraltar, we saw three red hairs lying on a wheelbarrow before a baker's door. But they were not the hairs of a man, they were the hairs of a fur coat. Nowhere, on land or water, could we see any sign of this boy's uncle. And if we could not see him, then he is not to be seen. For John Doolittle, we have done our best. Then the six great birds flapped their big wings and flew back to their homes in the mountains and the rocks. Well, said Dab Dab after they had gone. What are we going to do now? The boy's uncle must be found. There's no two ways about that. The lad isn't old enough to be knocking around the world by himself. Boys aren't like ducklings. They have to be taken care of till they're quite old. I wish Chi-Chi were here. He would soon find the man. Good old Chi-Chi. I wonder how he's getting on. If only we had Polynesia with us, said the white mouse. She would soon think of some way. Do you remember how she got us all out of the prison the second time? My, but she was a clever one. I don't think so much of those eagle, eagle fellows, said Jip. They're just conceited. They may have had very good eyesight and all that, but when you ask them to find a man for you, they can't do it, and they have the cheek to come back and say that nobody else could. They're just conceited, like that Collie and Puddleby, and I don't think a whole lot of those gossipy old porpoises either. All they could tell us was that the man isn't in the sea. We don't want to know where he isn't. We want to know where he is. Oh, don't talk so much, said Gub-Gub. It's easy to talk, but it isn't so easy to find a man when you've got the whole world to hunt him in. Maybe the fisherman's hair had turned white, worrying about the boy, and that was why the eagles didn't find him. You don't know everything. You're just talking. You're not doing anything to help. You couldn't find the boy's uncle any more than the eagles could. You couldn't do as well. Couldn't I, said the dog. That's all you know, you stupid piece of warm bacon. I haven't begun to try yet, have I? You wait and see. Then Jip went to the doctor and said, 
Ask the boy if he has anything in his pockets that belong to his uncle, will you please? So the doctor asked him, and the boy showed them a gold ring which he wore on a piece of string around his neck because it was too big for his finger. He said his uncle gave it to him when they saw the pirates coming. Jip smelled the ring and said, That's no good. Ask him if he has anything else that belonged to his uncle. Then the boy took from his pocket a great big red handkerchief and said, This was my uncle's too. As soon as the boy pulled it out, Jip shouted, Snuff by Jingo! Black rappy snuff! Don't you smell it? This uncle took snuff. Ask him, doctor. The doctor questioned the boy again, and he said, Yes, my uncle took a lot of snuff. Fine, said Jip. That man's as good as found. T'will be as easy as stealing milk from a kitten. Tell the boy I'll find his uncle for him in less than a week. Let us go upstairs and see which way the wind is blowing. But it is dark now, said the doctor. You can't find him in the dark. I don't need any light to look for a man who smells a black rat pea snuff, said Jif as he climbed the stairs. If the man had a hard smell, like string now, or hot water, it would be different. But snuff! T Does hot water have a smell? asked the doctor. Certainly it has, said Jip. Hot water smells quite different from cold water. It is warm water, or ice, that has a really difficult smell. Why, I once followed a man for ten miles on a dark night by the smell of the hot water he had used to shave with, for the poor fellow had no soap. Now then, let us see which, the way, which way the wind is blowing. Wind is very important in long-distance smelling. It mustn't be too fierce a wind, and of course it must blow the right way. A nice, steady, damp breeze is the best of all. Ha! This wind is from the north. Then Jip went up to the front of the ship and smelled the wind, and he started muttering to himself, Tar, Spanish onions, kerosene oil, wet raincoats, crushed laurel leaves, rubber burning, lace curtains being washed, no, my mistake, lace curtains hanging out to dry, and foxes, hundreds of them, cubs, and... Can you really smell all those different things in this one wind? asked the doctor. Why, of course, said Jip, and those are only a few of the easy smells, the strong ones. Any mongrel could smell those with a cold in the head. Wait now and I'll tell you some of the harder scents that are coming on this wind, a few of the dainty ones. Then the dog shut his eyes tight, poked his nose straight up in the air, and sniffed hard with his mouth half open. For a long time he said nothing. He kept as still as a stone. He hardly seemed to be breathing at all. When at last he began to speak, it sounded almost as though he were singing, sadly in a dream. Bricks, he whispered very low. Old yellow bricks, crumbling with age in a garden wall, the sweet breath of young cows standing in a mountain stream, the lead roof of a dovecote, or perhaps a granary, with a midday sun on it, black kid gloves lying in a bureau drawer of walnut wood, a dusty road with a horse's drinking trough beneath the sycamores, little mushrooms bursting through the rotting leaves, and, and, and... Any parsnips? asked Gub Gub. No, said Jip. You always think of things to eat. No parsnips whatsoever. And no snuff. Plenty of pipes and cigarettes and a few cigars, but no snuff. We must wait till the wind changes to the south. Yes, it's a poor wind, that, said Gub Gub. I think you're a fake, Jip. Who ever heard of finding a man in the middle of the ocean just by smell? I told you you couldn't do it. Look here, said Jip, getting really angry. You're going to get a bite on the nose in a minute. You needn't think that just because the doctor won't let us give you what you deserve that you can be as cheeky as you like. Stop quarreling, said the doctor. Stop it. Life is too short. Tell me, Jip, where do you think those smells are coming from? Uh, from Devon and Wales, most of them, said Jip. The wind is coming that way. Well, well, said the doctor. You know that's really quite remarkable. Quite. I must make a note of that for my new book. I wonder if you could train me to smell as well as that. But no, perhaps I'm better off the way I am. Enough is as good as a feast, they say. Let's go down to supper. I'm quite hungry. So am I, said Gub Gub. The 19th Chapter
the rock. Up they got early next morning out of the silken beds, and they saw that the sun was shining brightly and that the wind was blowing from the south. Jip smelled the south wind for half an hour. Then he came to the doctor, shaking his head. I smell no snuff as of yet, he said. We must wait till the wind changes to the east. But even when the east wind came, at three o'clock that afternoon, the dog could not catch the smell of snuff. The little boy was terribly disappointed and began to cry again, saying that no one seemed to be able to find his uncle for him. But all Jip said to the doctor was, Tell him that when the wind changes to the west, I'll find his uncle even if he's in China, so long as he is still taking black rappy snuff. Three days they had to wait before the west wind came. This was on a Friday morning, early, just as it was getting light. A fine rainy mist lay on the sea like a thin fog, and the wind was soft and warm and wet. As soon as Jip awoke, he ran upstairs and poked his nose in the air. Then he got most frightfully excited and rushed down again to wake the doctor up. Doctor, he cried, I've got it, doctor. Doctor, wake up. Listen, I've got it. The wind's from the west and it smells of nothing but snuff. Come upstairs and take the ship, quick. So the doctor tumbled out of bed and went to the rudder to steer the ship. Now I'll go up to the front, said Jip, and you watch my nose. Whichever way I point it, you turn the ship that same way. The man cannot be far off with a smell as strong as this, and the wind's all lovely and wet. Now watch me. So all that morning, Jip stood in the front of part of the ship, sniffing the wind and pointing the way for the doctor to steer while all the animals and the little boy stood round with their eyes wide open, watching the dog in wonder. About lunchtime, Jip asked Dab-Dab to tell the doctor that he was getting worried and wanted to speak to him. So Dab-Dab went and fetched the doctor from the other end of the ship, and Jip said to him, The boy's uncle is starving. We must make the ship go as fast as we can. How do you know he's starving? asked the doctor. Because there is no other smell in the west wind but snuff said Jip. If the man were cooking or eating food of any kind, I would be bound to smell it too. But he hasn't even fresh water to drink. All he is taking is snuff, in large pinches. We are getting near to him all the time, because the smell grows stronger every minute. But make that ship go as fast as you can, for I am certain that the man is starving. All right, said the doctor. And he sent Dab-Dab to ask the swallows to pull the ship, the same as they had done when the pirates were chasing them. So the stout little birds came down and once more harnessed themselves to the ship. And now the boat went bounding through the waves at a terrible speed. It went so fast that the fishes in the sea had to jump for their lives to get out of the way and not be run over. And all the animals got tremendously excited, and they gave up looking at Jip and turned to watch the sea in front to spy out any land or islands where the starving man might be. But hour after hour went by, and still the ship went rushing on, over the same flat, flat sea, and no land anywhere came into sight. And now the animals gave up chattering and sat around silent, anxious, and miserable. The little boy grew sad again and on Jip's face there was a worried look. At last, late in the afternoon, just as the sun was going down, the owl, Tutu, who was perched on the tip of the mast, suddenly startled them all by crying out at the top of his voice, Jip! Jip! I see a great, great rock in front of us! Look! Way out there where the sky and the water meet! See the sun shine on it! Like gold! Is the smell coming from there? And Jip called back, Yes, that's it. That is where the man is. At last, at last. And when they got near, they could see that the rock was very large, as large as a big field. No trees grew on it, no grass, nothing. The great rock was as smooth and as bare as the back of a tortoise. Then the doctor sailed the ship right around the rock, but nowhere on it could a man be seen. All the animals screwed up their eyes and looked as hard as they could, and John Doolittle got a telescope from downstairs. But not one living thing could they spy, not even, even a gull, nor a starfish, nor a shred of seaweed. They all stood still and listened, straining their ears for any sound, but the only noise they heard was the gentle lapping of the little waves against the sides of their ship. 
Then they all started calling, Hello there! Hello! till their voices were hoarse. But only the echo came back from the rock. And the little boy burst into tears and said, I'm afraid I shall never see my uncle anymore. What shall I tell them when I get home? But Jip called to the doctor. He must be there. He must. He must. The smell goes on no farther. He must be there, I tell you. Sail the ship close to the rock and let me jump out onto it. So the doctor brought the ship as close as he could and let down the anchor. Then he and Jip got out of the ship onto the rock. Jip at once put his nose down close to the ground and began to run all over the place. Up and down he went, back and forth, zigzagging, twisting, doubling, and turning. And everywhere he went, the doctor ran behind him, close at his heels, till he was terribly out of breath. At last, Jip let out a great bark and sat down. And when the doctor came running up to him, he found the dog staring into a big, deep hole in the middle of the rock. The boy's uncle is down there, said Jip quietly. No wonder those silly eagles couldn't see him. It takes a dog to find a man. So the doctor got down into the hole, which seemed to be a kind of cave or tunnel, running a long way around the ground. Then he struck a match and started to make his way along the dark passage, with Jip following behind. The doctor's match soon went out, and he had to strike another, and another, and another. At last the passage came to an end, and the doctor found himself in a kind of tiny room with walls of rock. And there, in the middle of the room, his head resting on his arms, lay a man with very red hair, fast asleep. Jip went up and sniffed at something lying on the ground beside him. The doctor stooped and picked it up. It was an enormous snuff box, and it was full of black rapee. The Twentieth Chapter The Fisherman's Town Gently then, very gently, the doctor woke the man up. But just at that moment, the match went out again, and the man thought it was Ben Ali coming back, and he began to punch the doctor in the dark. But when John Doolittle told him who it was, and that he had his little nephew safe on his ship, the man was tremendously glad and said he was sorry he had fought the doctor. He had not hurt him much, though, because it was too dark to punch properly. Then he gave the doctor a pinch of snuff. And the man told how the Barbary dragon had put him onto this rock and left him there when he wouldn't promise to become a pirate, and how he used to sleep down in this hole because there was no house on the rock to keep him warm. And then he said, For four days I have had nothing to eat or drink. I have lived on snuff. There you are, said Jip. What did I tell you? So they struck some more matches and made their way out through the passage into the daylight, and the doctor hurried the man down to the boat to get some soup. When the animals and the little boy saw the doctor and Jip coming back to the ship with a red-headed man, they began to cheer and yell and dance about the boat, and the swallows up above started whistling at the top of their voices, thousands and millions of them, to show that they, too, were glad that the boy's brave uncle had been found. The noise they made was so great that sailors far out at sea thought that a terrible storm was coming. Hark to that gale howling in the east, they said. And Jip was awfully proud of himself, though he tried hard not to look conceited. When Dab Dab came to him and said, Jip, I had no idea you were so clever. He just tossed his head and answered, Oh, that's nothing special, but it takes a dog to find a man, you know. Birds are no good for a game like that. Then the doctor asked the red-haired fisherman where his home was, and when he had told him, the doctor asked the swallows to guide the ship there first. And when they had come to the land that the man had spoken of, they saw a little fishing town at the foot of a rocky mountain, and the man pointed out the house where he lived. And while they were letting down the anchor, the little boy's mother, who was also the man's sister, came running down to the shore to meet them, laughing and crying at the same time. She had been sitting on a hill for twenty days, watching the sea and waiting for them to return. And she kissed the doctor many times so that he giggled and blushed like a schoolgirl. And she tried to kiss Jip too, but he ran away and hid inside the ship. It's a silly business, this kissing, he said. I don't hold by it. 
Let her go and kiss Gub-Gub, if she must kiss something. The fisherman and his sister didn't want the doctor go to go away again in a hurry. They begged him to spend a few days with them. So John Doolittle and his animals had to stay at their house a whole Saturday and Sunday and half of Monday. And all the little boys of the fishing village went down to the beach and pointed at the great ship anchored there and said to one another in whispers, Look, that was a pirate ship, Ben Ali's, the most terrible pirate that ever sailed the seven seas. That old gentleman with the high hat who's staying up at Mrs. Trevlon's, he took the ship away from the Barbary dragon and made him into a farmer. Who'd have thought of it him, him so gentle-like and all? Look at the great red sails. Ain't she a wicked-looking ship and fast? My! All those two days and a half that the doctor stayed at the little fishing town, the people kept asking him out to teas and luncheons and dinners and parties, and all the ladies sent him boxes of flowers and candies, and the village band played tunes under his window every night. At last, the doctor said, Good people, I must go home now. You have really been most kind. I shall always remember it, but I must go home, for I have things to do. Then, just as the doctor was about to leave, the mayor of the town came down the street, and a lot of other people in grand clothes with him. And the mayor stopped before the house where the doctor was living. Everybody in the village gathered round to see what was going to happen. After six page boys had blown on shining trumpets to make the people stop talking, the doctor came out onto the steps and the mayor spoke. Dr. John Doolittle, he said, it is a great pleasure for me to present to the man who rid the seas of the dragon of Barbary this little token from the grateful people of our worthy town. And the mayor took from his pocket a little tissue paper packet and opening it, he handed it to the doctor a perfectly beautiful watch with real diamonds in the back. Then the mayor pulled out of his pocket a still larger parcel and said, where is the dog? Then everybody started to hunt for Jip, and at last Dab Dab found him on the other side of the village in a stable yard, where all the dogs of the countryside were standing round him speechless with admiration and respect. When Jip was brought to the doctor's side, the mayor opened the larger parcel, and inside was a dog collar made of solid gold. And a great murmur of wonder went up from the village folk as the mayor bent down and fastened it round the dog's neck with his own hands. For written on the collar in big letters were the words, Jip, the cleverest dog in the world. Then the whole crowd moved down to the beach to see them off. And after the red-haired fisherman and his sister and the little boy had thanked the doctor and his dog over and over and over again, the great swift ship with the red sails was turned once more toward Puddleby, and they sailed out to sea while the village band music played on the shore. The 21st Chapter Home Again March winds had come and gone, April showers were over, May's buds had opened into flower, and the June sun was shining on the pleasant fields when John Doolittle at last got back to his own country. But he did not yet go home to Puddleby. First he went traveling through the land with the Push Me Pull You in a caravan, stopping at all the country fairs. And there, with the acrobats on one side of them and the Punch and Judy show on the other, they would hang out a big sign that read, Come and see the marvelous two-headed animal from the jungles of Africa. Admission six pence. And the push me pull you would stay inside the wagon while the other animals would lie about underneath. The doctor sat in a chair in front taking the six pences and smiling on the people as they went in. And Dab Dab was kept busy all the time scolding him because he would let the children in for nothing when she wasn't looking. And the menagerie keepers and circus men came and asked the doctor to sell them the strange creature, saying they would pay a tremendous lot of money for him. But the doctor always shook his head and said, Nope, the push-me-pull-you shall never be shut up in a cage. He shall be free always to come and go, like you and me. Many curious sights and happenings they saw in this wandering life, but they all seemed quite ordinary after the great things they had seen and done in foreign lands. It was very interesting at first, 
being sort of a part of a circus, but after a few weeks, they all got dreadfully tired of it, and the doctor and all of them were longing to go home. But so many people came flocking to the little wagon and paid the sixpence to go inside and see the push me pull you that very soon the doctor was able to give up being a showman. And one fine day, when the hollyhocks were in full bloom, he came back to Puddleby a rich man to live in the little house with the big garden. And the old lame horse in the stable was glad to see him, and so were the swallows who had already built their nest under the eaves of his roof and had young ones. And Dab-Dab was glad, too, to get back to the house she knew so well, although there was a terrible lot of dusting to be done with cobwebs everywhere. And after Jip had gone and shown his golden collar to the conceited collie next door, he came back and began running round the garden like a crazy thing, looking for the bones he had buried long ago and chasing the rats out of the tool shed, while Gub-Gub dug up the horseradishes, which had grown three feet high in the corner by the garden wall. The doctor went and saw the sailor who had lent him the boat, and he bought two new ships for him and a rubber doll for his baby, and he paid the grocer for the food he had lent him for the journey to Africa. Then he bought another piano and put the white mice back in it, because they said the bureau drawer was drafty. Even when the doctor had filled the old money box on the dresser shelf, he still had a lot of money left, and he had to get three more boxes, just as big, to put the rest in. Money, he said, is a terrible nuisance, but it's nice not to have to worry. Yes, said Dab-Dab, who was toasting muffins for his tea. It is indeed. And when the winter came again, and the snow flew against the kitchen window, the doctor and his animals would sit round the big warm fire after supper, and he would read aloud to them out of his books. But far away in Africa, where the monkeys chattered in the palm trees before they went to bed under the big yellow moon, they would say to one another, I wonder what the good man's doing now, over there in England. Do you think he will ever come back? And Polynesia would squeak out from the vines, I think he will. I guess he will. I hope he will. And then the crocodile would grunt up at them from the black mud of the river. I'm sure he will. Go to sleep. The end. We hope you enjoyed this reading of the story of Dr. Doolittle as part of our Booked for the Night series. Until next time, thanks for listening and good night.